Hello there. Uh, here to talk about our next topic. We're getting into ecology a little bit. And so we're going to talk about some basic population ecology. This is uh, chapter 14 in your book. And so you'll recall that a population has many different definitions, but one that we can use is it's, it's a group of individuals of the same species that are interacting in the same area. Uh, so we talk about populations quite a bit. It's one of those functional units in biology that, you know, a lot of things happen at the population level. And that's why we talk about populations. So you remember we talked about evolution. We said that the most important unit of evolution is the population. You know, individuals don't evolve, populations do. And we see for many other reasons, the population is an interesting grouping in biology. And so that's why we're talking about that today. Understanding the dynamics of a population is very important to ecology. And that's what we're going to just sort of introduce in this lecture. Something else we talk about with populations is that they exhibit emergent properties. And so properties that emerge from the interaction of individuals. And so you have all these individual organisms that are sort, you know, doing their own thing in the population, but by interacting together, you get extra qualities from the population, emergent properties that you don't get from just studying the individuals. Uh, you know, the saying is the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And this is an example. So that's, again, that's why we study populations. Um, and it's a very important uh, area in ecology. And so there are lots of different ways and, and different books and different people talk about different things, but, but we can kind of basically break down uh, populations or talk about population dynamics based on four main characters, uh, characteristics, density, age structure, mortality rate, and natality rate. So this is a little bit different than what your book says, but if you read your book, you'll see how these things fit into this structure. We could also maybe add a fifth here. We could say that populations have a genetic structure, but we're not going to get into that today. And so by studying these four characteristics, we can learn about the, the biology and the ecology of the population. And so we're, we're interested in how do all these things interact to influence the entire population and what are the consequences of that. So let's start by talking about density. And that's just the number of organisms per unit area. And so the size, the number of organisms is only part of that, right? It's the number of organisms per unit area, how closely packed in organisms are. And this is something that influences a lot in a population. So it's one of the first things that we want to study. Measuring density is important. Knowing how many organisms you have in a unit area is something that, as ecologists, we spend a lot of time uh, doing. Lots of ways we could do this. One of the interesting ones and ones that we use a lot is called a mark recapture, a mark recapture estimate. And so basically you capture a number of individuals, tag them, you know, mark them somehow, and then release them back into the population. And you give them time to disperse themselves randomly and mix back into the population. Then you come back and you take a second sample from that population. But in the second sample, there'll be some of the organisms will be marked and some will be unmarked. But if those organisms distribute, that those marked ones distribute themselves randomly, you can use that to estimate the size of the population. And so if we take that second sample and we count how many are marked and we count how many uh, total organisms we caught in the second sample and we compare that ratio to the total number that we marked, because you know we marked them, we know how many have a mark, we can use that to estimate the number in the population. We know how many we marked because we marked them. In the second sample, we know how many are marked because we just caught them and we can tell if they're marked. And we know how many we caught 
And so if we fill in those values that we know, we can estimate the total number in the population. That's what we want to know. And so that's a, uh, basically what a mark recapture population is called, a Peterson mark recapture uh, estimation. And there are ways to make this more sophisticated, but basically this is the basic idea. And you can see if you study this math, you can see why this works, right? The number marked in the second sample divided by the total in the second sample, that's the proportion or the percent marked in the second sample. Well, if those organisms are distributed randomly, that percentage should estimate the percentage marked in the whole population. Well, how do you get the percentage marked in the whole population? The total number marked divided by the total population. We know the total number marked, but what we're trying to find out is the total number in the population. So you can see that we know three of the four variables here we solve for the fourth. So that's um, just... It, oh, you know, there's no way you can go and capture all the individuals in a population, but by taking a sample, we can extrapolate from that sample and get an estimate of the number. But then again, it, it, remember, it depends upon the size, the area. The number has to be divided by the area, so you get the number per unit area. Um, and so this is, again, an example from your figure from your book just showing where they took uh, beetles and they marked them, and we've done this before, paint or white out, or there's all kinds of ways you can mark them. Let them distribute themselves. You take a second sample, you plug those numbers into that formula, you can estimate how many beetles you have. And so if you are a hunter or a fisherman, if you interact with wildlife, you may have run across marked individuals. And there's lots of reasons that we mark organisms, but this is a big reason why. And so here's an example of a fish. You see they just did a little hole punch in their dorsal fin. They don't have any nerves there. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't grow back. If you caught this fish again, you'd know it was a marked fish. Um, here's a white-tailed deer. It's got an ear tag. It's also got a radio collar. You can see it's got that collar on there, so you can use that collar to find where the deer is and track it, but it's got that tag. Here's a duck banding. Duck banding is a big thing, and so if you uh, hunt ducks, you shoot ducks, every once in a while you get one with a band on it. And you can use these to tell, like, you know, how far they migrate and, and how old they are. A lot of things you can, you can use the mark for, but a mark recapture is, is one of the most important. Uh, here's a marked butterfly. Uh, and so you can capture a bunch of butterflies, mark them, come back in a week, capture a bunch more. How, see how many of them have the mark, how many don't have the mark, and you can estimate how many butterflies you've got. Okay, so just to practice here, um, let's say I capture 75 fish and mark them, give them a fin clip. I release them back into the lake, wait a little bit, go back, I take a second sample. In this second sample, I catch 120 fish. Of those 120 fish, 33 of them have that mark, have that fin clip I gave them. So, how many fish are in this lake? 202, 53, 273, or 21. So, pause the video, use that formula, see if you can give me the answer. All right, well, the answer is 273, right? You take the number marked in the second sample, which is 33, divided by the total caught in the second sample, that's 120, that equals the total number marked, which is 75, divided by the total number in the population, which is what we're trying to figure out, which turns out to be 273. And again, the proportion that have the mark in the second sample is an estimate of the proportion that have the mark in the whole population. Since you know how many you marked, you can set these two proportions equal and solve for the total population size. Okay, um, Okay, another characteristic that populations have is age structure. An age structure is just the relative number 
of the different ages or the different age classes. And also when we do age structure, we usually break it down into males versus females. And so it's often graphically depicted in, in sort of a, a graph something like this. So here's a figure from your book. And um, you know, this is very common, commonly done with human populations because um, our age structure not only does it have a lot to do with our population, our human population, and the e ecological characteristics, but also the sociological characteristics, right? Things like uh, social security, right? Depend upon, you have a bunch of younger people working so that they can pay taxes to support older people who've worked and now retired and things like that. And so the relative number of young versus old and how quickly uh, uh, people uh, are, are born and how quickly they die all you know and, and things like insurance all that is very much influenced by human age structure well that's all you know I mean that's some there's some ecology in that too but but it's also very important in non-human populations the examples I have here are human populations but anyway you see what we're looking at here we're looking at the relative numbers of individuals at these different age classes and that's going to influence the size of the population and how fast it grows and things like that. And so if you're looking here at uh, like India in 2010 and versus the United States in 2010, and you can see you've got very different shape, right? And they're highlighting the reproductive years, which is important because that's when you're, you know, contributing babies to the population and, and, um, and how many babies are being contributed is important. And that's going to influence then the, the young, the, you know, how many young you have, and, and then you also can see how, how quickly people die off, and that's going to influence the size of the population. Um, you can see that you've got very different shape here, and you've got, um, you know, India, whose population is growing very rapidly and is very huge, versus the United States, and our population growth is, is much more moderate. And again, look at the, the numbers on the x-axis, and you can see that, you know, the the scale is quite different. There's, you know, India's got a lot more people and they're growing a lot faster. And so, not just for humans, but for all organisms, if you, if you look at an age structure, you're looking at the relative numbers, but then how long does it take to reach sexual maturity? Those reproductive years are very important. What are the reproductive ages? Those kind of things all interact to determine the structure of the population. Here's some other examples from humans. This is from a little bit long, uh, this is about 2009, I think. And you see Afghanistan, same kind of shape as India. You've got lots of young people, fewer old people. You're gonna have a fast growing population um, because you've got lots of people in their reproductive years. Here's again, the United States. This is from like 2009. You see that same growth. You see the baby boomers there. Uh, in the, the 40s and 50s um, that are sort of past reproductive growth. And so our population isn't growing as fast as some of those other countries. Here you've got something like Italy where you see a higher proportion of older people above reproductive age. And so they don't have a lot of growth. Their population is more stable. And so, like I said, this is important for things like, like social security, retirements, in insurance for humans, but for all organisms, this is very important for determining their population structure. Okay, so kind of related to that are these other population characteristics we mentioned, which is uh, natality and mortality rates. Natality are birth rates, mortality is death rates. And so the age structure is going to influence these rates and, and they're going to, the death and, and birth rates are going to influence the size of the population. So it's all kind of interact, interrelated here. Um, and so, like we said, that age structure it influences whether the population's growing or shrinking or stable. So we saw the different countries and how their age structure influenced that. And, and this is related to the birth rate and the death rate. And so what we're really interested here, we're interested in here, is how that birth rate and death rate combine to influence the rate of change of the population. And so that's something that we really spend a lot of time talking about when we talk about population ecology. It's not just the density of the population, but how quickly that density is changing. That's also very important.
And so if you think back to the examples I gave earlier, where I had a simple model and we looked at rabbits and the meadow and growth and, and you saw that the, the density changed from year to year and uh, you know how quickly it changed. So some years the rabbit population was low and some years the rabbit population was high. Well, that's what we ask ourselves a lot in population ecology. Well, why? Why did the population size change and how quickly does it change? How quickly does it grow? How quickly does it shrink? These are the sort of things that we study in population ecology. And so, for example, let's, let's imagine that we had a, a brand new population. We're going to start from scratch. We've got a meadow that's got unlimited grass. The grass grows, you know, uh, super quick and there's no limited amount of grass. There's no predators. There's perfect weather. It's an idealized conditions for the rabbits, okay? And we just put a couple of rabbits in the meadow. What's going to happen? Well, you know, rabbits, they breed like rabbits, right? And so they're going to have babies and their babies are going to have babies, just like we saw in the, the model. But in the model, you remember that the grass was realistic. You know, the grass grew during the summer and then died back in the winter. So the grass changed and that influenced the rabbit population. But in this idealized scenario that I'm giving you now, the grass just never disappeared. You know, there's, there's always unlimited grass, always unlimited uh, resources. There's no coyotes. There's nothing to eat the rabbits. So in that situation, which of these graphs would best represent the number of rabbits over time? Well, in an idealized situation, you're going to get what we call J-shaped growth. The population is going to grow because there's no limit to the resources, there's no predators, and so they're just going to have babies, and then those babies are going to have babies. Now the population is going to grow, and it's going to grow slowly, but as you get more and more rabbits in those reproductive years, and they start having babies, then the population is going to start growing faster and faster and faster and faster, and as you plotted it, it's going to look like graph B here. And we call that exponential growth. And so under idealized conditions where there's just no limits, the population is going to grow in this exponential fashion. Relate this back to what we talked about earlier. We said one of Darwin's key observations was that all organisms over reproduce, right? If you look at any organism on the planet, it produces more babies than you expect to survive. And so consequently, if you have unlimited resources, you're going to have all those babies that do survive, and then they're going to have babies. That's going to lead to exponential growth. The birth rate's going to be extremely high. The death rate's going to be very low. You're going to have lots of individuals at that reproductive age, so you're going to, your babies are going to start having babies, and they're going to start having babies. And so you get J-shaped population growth, or exponential population growth. And so here's a couple of different examples of this model, but you see that they both have that J shape where they, they grow slowly at first, but they start growing faster. And so that's the thing to, to remember. Not only is the population getting bigger, you're getting more rabbits or you're getting more whatever, but it's getting bigger faster. The rate of change is constantly increasing. The growth rate is constantly increasing. And that's what's going to happen when you have that overreproduction. And so here's an example of a uh, um, an example of this uh, where there was a nature park and elephants were reintroduced to the nature park. And so you think elephants, again, are like the slowest reproducing things on the planet. And you see that, that over the first several decades, you had population growth. The population was getting bigger, but it was growing slowly. But over time, not only did the population get bigger, it got bigger faster. The rate of growth 
kept going up and you get this typical j-shaped curve well you, again you've got idealized conditions for these elephants right there's no predators it's a protected park they've got unlimited resources uh, there's not a lot of competition because uh, the population starts off low and so under those conditions you get this exponential growth well how realistic is that right how realistic is it for a population to just keep growing and again not getting bigger but get bigger faster that's not very realistic right uh, realistically at some point the growth rate is going to slow and then stop the population is not going to disappear but the population is not going to grow anymore it's going to reach a steady state which we would call carrying capacity and so this is a more realistic idea of what happens to populations is that the growth rate is fast but then it slows and then eventually the population doesn't grow anymore the population is still there the numbers are still there the population is just not growing and we call that logistic growth and that level at where the population stops and that equilibrium it reaches we call the carrying capacity that's the maximum number of, of organisms that the environment can support and so like I said that's that's called the logistic growth model and so the per capita rate of increase declines as you approach carrying capacity so the rate of increase so it, it you know the the population is still growing but it's growing slower but then eventually the population stops growing and you get what's known as sigmoidal curves or s-shaped curves and so that's what's shown in the red here the blue is exponential growth which we talked about before and that's a little unrealistic the red is more realistic it's logistic growth which is sigmoidal or s-shaped and so a classic example of this is um, you could take a, an organism called a paramecium. It's a little protozoan. Um, and they're small and you can grow them in, in test tubes. And you can look at the number of paramecians over time. And you see that you get this type of S-shaped growth. And the number of paramecians levels out at the carrying capacity. Now early on, you have those idealized conditions. You've got basically unlimited nutrients and unlimited space uh, because the population density is low. And so you start out with exponential growth. But eventually, that rate of growth slows down. The population is still getting bigger. So you see you're like around you know, day, day seven or day eight. The population is still growing, but it's not growing as quickly eventually around day nine or ten the rate of growth drops to zero the population doesn't drop to zero the density stays high but it doesn't grow anymore and so that is carrying capacity now what happens as that density approaches carrying capacity do the birth rates increase do the death rates increase? Do the birth rates decrease? Do the death rates decrease? Or is it more than one of these? A couple of these. Well, it's a couple of these. As you get closer to the carrying capacity, mortality rate goes up, natality rate goes down. These two things are always interacting with each other. And so early on, when the density is low and you're in exponential growth, birth rate is greater than death rate so you're having more bo more born than die so the population gets bigger that makes sense at some point though the death rate becomes higher than the birth rate and so you're still having births but you're also having more deaths and eventually those two equal out and so then you have you reach an equilibrium and you reach carrying capacity As, uh, you know again I, I want to make make this clear is that you know before you reach carrying capacity the size of the the population and thus the density of the population is still increasing but it's not increasing as quickly the rate of change is slowing down eventually the rate of change goes to zero 
but the population doesn't disappear. The population stays at that carrying capacity. Okay, so what happens then? How come populations can't just get bigger and bigger and bigger? Why do the death rates go up and the birth rates go down as you get near carrying capacity? What kind of things influence that? Well, again, there's lots of different ways you could organize this, and, and different books will do it in different ways. But this is a pretty good example of the things that happen as you approach carrying capacity. Competition for resources goes up. Territoriality goes up. Disease has a bigger influence. Predation has a bigger influence. Toxic wastes build up. Intrinsic factors start to kick in. We'll talk about each of these in detail. But all of these things are what we call density dependent factors. They get more acute as the density increases. And so that's why measuring density is so important. That's you know, the first thing we talked about is measuring you know, marker capture and let's measure the density. It's because as the density goes up, these things become more intense. And so, for example, when the density is low, competition is not very intense. But as the density gets higher, now competition for resources becomes a much bigger deal. So the, 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 the effect changes depending upon the density. Toxic waste are not, they don't really build up when you've got a slow density population, but as the density gets higher, you get more toxic waste and so on. That's what we mean by density dependent effects. It depends on the density. And so let's talk about each of these in just a very brief detail. In a crowded population, you just have more organisms competing for the same resources. So consequently, you've got more competition. So you spend more you know, energy on competition and then you have a lower birth rate. And so if you look at this dense stand of, of plants, you know, you don't think of, when we think of competition, we're animals and we think of, you know, nature red and tooth and claw, but at all organisms compete. And so these plants are competing for things like light and nutrients and water and pollinators. And the more plants, the more dense you have, the more intense that competition is and that lowers the birth rate and it sets the carrying capacity. Um, lots of organisms defend territories and this is a way to help them kind of control resources. Well as the density goes up, so does territoriality. You spend more energy defending your territory. You see this cheetah marking its territory. You see these birds that are evenly spaced. They are all defending their nest area. The more population you've got, the more you have to work to defend your territory. Birth rate goes down, death rate goes up. That sets the limit to the size of the population. The more dense the population, the easier pathogens can spread and the more uh, influence that does. Well, of course, this is something that's you know very germane to us right now. We're right in the middle of the COVID crisis and um, the more dense the population, the easier that virus can spread from person to person. You know, the virus spreads by being expelled out of the respiratory tract and making those aerosols. And if you've got a dense population, it's more likely that those virus particles are going to land on someone else and, and find a, a new host. Um, that's again, why wearing masks is so important. That's why social distancing is so important. Um, the more dense the population, the easier that, you know, not just viruses, but lots of diseases can spread. And so that starts to set a limit to the dense, the, the, a limit to the size or to a limit to the density of a population that sets the carrying capacity. Um, predation can get more intense as the density gets higher. So for example, um, you've got these trout that feed on mayflies. When the mayfly population is low, it has a low density, the trout don't really pay attention to them. It's not worth their time. But as that density of mayflies gets higher and higher and higher, the trout switch to mayflies and their predation rate gets higher because now it's worth their time. And so the trout will feed on the mayflies more as the density goes up. And so that sets a limit to how high the mayfly density can be. You remember those models that I showed you where we had rabbits and we also had coyotes, right? And as the number of rabbits went up, 
that was able to support more coyotes. And you got more coyotes, they eat more rabbits, and that influenced the rabbit population. And so that sets a limit to how high that rabbit population could get because you could have more coyotes. So predation can become more intense as density goes up. Uh, toxic wastes can build up as the population gets more dense, and that can limit the population and, and set the carrying capacity. Yeast is a good example. You know, as the yeast reproduces and, and um, their population gets larger, and yeast ferments sugars, and that's how they get energy. A byproduct of that fermentation is alcohol. And as you get more and more yeast, and they produce more and more alcohol, that alcohol is actually toxic to the yeast and it, and it starts to kill more of the yeast. And so that limits how much yeast you can get because they're toxic byproducts. Well, that's true of, of, of all populations. They produce these toxic byproducts and if you can't treat them or get rid of them, that can start to limit the size of the population. Finally, there's things that we call intrinsic factors or physiological factors. Things within the organism's physiology or within their body that change related to population size that ultimately set the limit to population size. So for example, this mouse population, as the mouse population gets more dense, that causes them to release different pheromones, which are you know hormones that signal other organisms. And those other those signals cause other mice to have lowered reproduction and also to depress their immune system, which you know, you're decreasing the birth rate, you're increasing the death rate, but that becomes more acute as the population gets more dense. And so then again, that sets a limit to how dense the population can be. And so that's the take home message here, right? A more realistic model of population size is one where the population first starts growing exponentially but then all those factors we just discussed all kick in. They become more acute as the population becomes more dense and they slow population growth. The population is still growing, but it's not growing as quickly. But then eventually growth goes to zero and the population levels off at the carrying capacity. And so that's just a kind of an introduction, basic idea behind some of the things we study in population ecology. Again, why do we talk about populations so much? Populations are one of those units in biology where interesting stuff goes on and, and the population can explain a lot of phenomena in biology. And you know, when we talk about evolution or, or, or lots of different things, the population is an important concept. So that's why we study it in a little bit more depth. Okay. So that's just our brief introduction into population ecology. Let me know if you got any questions. I'll see you later.